This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. After the U.S. military pulled out of Afghanistan, countless Afghan allies and their families were left with no protection, forced to run, hide, or be killed. Their stories are heart-wrenching. Ryan Morrow and Logan Keyswetter share surprising and practical methods you can use to help Afghans right now in very personal and direct ways. Because to the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Don't forget Afghanistan. There are so many distractions in the media that we seem to be going from crisis to crisis. But when a crisis happens, we need to remember that the problem is not necessarily solved when the media switches our attention to something else. So tonight, Ryan Morrow and Logan Keeswitter share how you can help people right now in Afghanistan. But first, it's a new month on the astronomical and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it on the screen. We saw the new month, uh, new moon rather, earlier this week, and we are now into the first Shabbat of the fifth month. So let's see what else is new with our partner services director, David Robinson. Hello, Scott. So How are you? Traveled a long ways to get here, all of what, 50 feet? So yeah. <laughs> from a little the worn out, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> a long slug from the office. Yeah, yeah a okay. long slug. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we have a new love gift that we want to talk about. Now, first of all, people say, you know, why do we talk about the love gift? Well, we need to. It, it's, you know, it's summer, especially right now. People forget to give, and giving is what keeps this going. Exactly. So yeah. uh, people say, well, why do you have to advertise on the Sabbath? Okay, well, number one, not a lot of people actually watch by Night Live on, on the Sabbath. They, right. They'll watch it during the week or after, mm -hmm. whenever they can. So, uh, and it's our only opportunity to talk to you all. So this is yeah, we're not only... asking you to buy on the Sabbath. We're just wanting to, right, to, to give, present right. it for the week. Yeah. Exactly. So whenever you can, we'll, we'll tell you about it. But if you per prefer to wait till after the Sabbath, please do. It's just our only opportunity to tell you about the things that we're, we're offering for a fundraiser. That's really what all these... And we really wish are. we didn't have to ask, honestly. Yeah. But... We do. We have to ask. To right. Uh, to, to Michael's words several years ago, he said, you know what? If we could just run the ministry on donations alone, that would be we great. would. That but would be great. It doesn't happen that way. Right. So, so some people would like certain, you know, some nice things for mm -hmm. uh, for their uh, gift. And that's why Michael Sir, wants to do Thank you. It. Yeah, he's always wanted to thank people for giving. So exactly. That's why we do this. And speaking of giving, so next week we start uh, a new series with David Lopez. Mm -hmm. And David Lopez is a, a former Navy SEAL mm -hmm. uh, who has all kinds of insider info you may or may not want to hear, but right. you know what? I think you need to hear it. Whether you mm -hmm. want to or not is irrelevant. So he starts with us next week. And uh, for all this month, he actually uh, donated a teaching to us mm -hmm. called Kingdom Come. Right. And that's what this is all about. So this is the new love gift for uh, August. And so I just want to read a little bit about what it's all about. So are the kingdoms of this world driving us to kingdom come? That's where this title, title comes from. Former Navy SEAL David Lopez shares an enlightening perspective on what's happening on the world stage. You'll learn who the major players are, why justice seems unattainable, mm -hmm. which we see all the, time. all the time. Why are these people getting away yeah. with what they're getting away with? Yep. Right? Evil's good, good is evil now. Right, the tables are turned. Yep. And how the kingdom of Yehovah wins in the end. So possibly that's the, the, you know, the good right. news in the end of all this. But we talk about big pharma. Mm -hmm. That's as if that's not been a topic in the last two years. The war on terror, gene editing, mm -hmm. which uh, we've, we've talked about on the stage as well with um, Doug, Doug Hamp. And that's a lot further along than probably we are even aware of. Right. So you've been in, in military before, so yeah. you know that the military gets to see things a lot sooner than before yeah. Joe Public does. Yeah, there's no telling. <laughs> so uh, video games, how does that play into things? Uh, digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. These, these are different things as well that you need to know the difference about. Um, so the Second Amendment, all kinds of stuff, and how that plays into are you, you going to be a victim or are you going to yeah. be the one? It's part one, of preparing, uh, right, you know, preparing for what's to come. And we did a whole series on that, yeah. that revelation preparation, yes. right? And so next week, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk to uh, Don Goodrich. That's right. Uh, who, he ran that uh, the ham radio, ham radio class. Technician class. Technician class, right. And so he has a new class uh, that you're going to hear all about next week. And it starts uh, August 22nd. So keep that in mind and watch Shabbat Night Live, Night Live next week. 
uh, to get all the details from Don himself. He's going to join us uh, here mm -hmm. on the show. So, Now, David, uh, so that is the gift for $50 or more. If it, folks want to give a, right. a gift for $50 or more. But we have a couple of other yeah, gifts as well. Yeah, and if you well. would like to give $100... Uh, we have this beautiful book, Holy Scripture in the Promised Land. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the artist, the French artist, he was a 19th century French artist, Gustave Doré. Uh, 15 years old, uh, just a few years after he went to a publishing company in France, and they had drawings, illustrations on their windows, and he goes, that's not what it should look like, it should look like this, and he showed them, and the publisher ran and got everybody in his office to come and look at what he was doing. Really? So he actually worked out a deal with his father to let him come back to Paris, give him board, room and board and so forth. And um, he was only supposed to do one drawing a week, but he actually, because of his work ethic, did a lot more than that. But you, you might not know his name, but I promise you, you've seen his paintings. I mean, this guy's got okay. paintings everywhere. But he did wood engraving, engravings. And this book has many of those uh, colorizations of his actual engravings of the Holy Land. Did you say he was 15? I see, he was this 15. is news to me. So. He, was, he was, if my... If I remember correctly, uh, just a few years after he started working for this major publishing house, Aubert, or Aubert I think is what it was called, okay. in France, a few years after that, he was the highest paying illustration illustrator in highly highest paid illustrator in France. Wow! So yeah, and he's, he's, just he's a incredible. Kid. Yeah, wow. really, really good. And so this is a colorization of his wood carvings that he did, and um, and then these wood carvings go with scripture. So okay. this is a great table so book. So the old Bible stories. Yeah, that he's, basically. He's yeah. So out. like okay. the the first topic here is let me get to it. It is uh, Adam and Eve expelled from the Garden of Eden. So he has a painting okay. of that, and so then of, then the testing of Abraham's faith. So it just goes through the Bible oh, and it has his drawings. Okay. Yeah. So it's a nice little coffee table yeah, book of those absolutely. pieces of art. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. Okay. So that's for a gift of hundred dollars. You get that and the teaching. Okay. Then you get uh, for three hundred dollars. Uh, or more if you would like, you get this uh, stained glass box set anointing oil. And, and you know what? We need to all buy this and go out in our community and just start slinging it on everybody and praying for them <laughs> the way the world is today, right? <laughs> right but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the gift of 300 is frankincense, uh, myrrh, and Rose of Rose Sharon. Sharon. I think was the Rose third one, right? yeah. And these are refillable if you want to put... Um, uh, more in it after you use it on your community. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but uh, it's also, if you don't want to put these in there, you got a nice little keepsake box. Beautiful. So, All right, wonderful. For your gift. And we, we really appreciate your giving. Yeah, especially through the summer. Like we said, sometimes it's tough in the summer. people go on vacation, they forget mm -hmm. to give, the tithe goes to vacation, vacation. <laughs> we get forgotten about. Exactly. So we need to keep going here. We got all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. in the works for, uh, over the next several months. It's really exciting stuff. So uh, we just encourage you to uh, get the love gift. These are gifts from Michael to you. Thank you in advance for that. Yes, and, thank uh, you. So David, thank you for joining us today. It's good to be here. Okay, before we go, here's a little bit of what you're gonna see tonight. If people supported the resistance to the Taliban and ISIS, they could defeat the Taliban and ISIS independently. You wouldn't have to say, oh, we well, have to vote the right person in office. No, in today's world, Americans, people in the free world can come together and actually fight our enemies and save the people that they're trying to persecute. All right, there you have it. So, after the U.S. military pulled out of Afghanistan, countless Afghan allies and their families were left with no protection. Tonight, you're going to find out how you can help them in a very personal and direct way. The Kiddish with Michael is next, stay tuned. Are the kingdoms of this world driving us to kingdom come? Former Navy SEAL David Lopez shares an enlightening perspective on what's happening on the world stage. You'll learn who the major players are, why justice seems unattainable, and how the kingdom of Yehovah wins in the end. How is God gonna redeem this world and make this new world? He's not gonna wanna destroy the righteous with the wicked. We know from Abraham's discourse that he doesn't. Well, he's separating us right now off of a very simple decision. Kingdom Come with David Lopez will give you a greater understanding as to how technology and systematic crises are being used to condition your choices. This special teaching is our gift to you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. We'll send you Kingdom Come with David Lopez on DVD or Blu-ray when you give a love gift donation of $50 in August. Donate $100 and we'll send you Kingdom Come, plus a coffee table book 
containing breathtaking 19th century artwork of famous stories in the Bible. Or donate $300 and we'll send you the teaching, the Bible Story Coffee Table Book, and a decorative glass box featuring artwork of the Tree of Life and three vials of anointing oil, frankincense, myrrh, and Rose of Sharon. These gifts are available for a limited time from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. These special gift collections are available only in August and supplies are limited. Get these exclusive thank you gifts now from Michael Rood. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. There is a rabbinic tradition, even a takanot, a law which changed biblical law, that before one eats bread, one must wash their hand with the two-handled pot, a negel vessel, and say this prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. Nowhere in the scripture is this ever commanded. In fact, the rabbis will plainly say that we are the ones that made it up, and when you are obeying us, you're obeying God. Well, Yeshua said, do not follow the takanot of the Pharisees. Do not follow their man-made rules and regulations. But every time there is bread, every time we can remember what Yeshua said, what he put in place. And we can say the prayer, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And Yeshua said, I am the bread brought forth from the earth. This represents my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, if it's every meal, if it's every Sabbath, you do it in remembrance of me, because by his stripes, we were healed. And Yeshua took the cup, and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Borei pari ha'gafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood, the broken covenant in which we were offered to be priests and kings, Yeshua paid the price, he renewed the covenant with us and made us priests and kings. And so as often as we do this, we remember this and we reign as priests and kings now and will do so in the future with Yeshua for a thousand years in our resurrected body along with his resurrected body. And we do this in remembrance of him. Shalom. Well, 
if you've always wanted to go to Israel and never got the chance and still don't have the chance now, we have another option for you. Last couple of weeks, we've talked about going to Mount Sinai. Yes, the real Mount Sinai. Saudi Arabia is open. You don't even need a vaccine to get over there. And uh, Ryan Morrow, uh, Mor Morrow, I'm sorry, Ryan Morrow yeah. <laughs> and Logan Kieswetter, welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. Thank you. Now, again, uh, your place or your uh, organization, rather, that is taking folks over to Mount Sinai is MountSinaiTours.com. Yep, gotcha. And your next... Tour is October? October, yep. Okay, very good. But we could do more or even go sooner, depending on the interest that people have. Whether they want to bring their whole church for a private tour, we can do that. Small group, large group, whatever. Okay, and all the information is on the website at the bottom of the screen there. Okay. Yep. Very good. Now, this week we wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about some other things that you're doing that maybe people don't know that you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, completely the opposite of taking a tour somewhere. It's uh, you guys are going into a place that people wouldn't necessarily want to go. This is Afghanistan. And I'm sure, you know, everyone was shocked earlier in 2022, uh, or 2021 rather, yeah. when uh, the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan left a bunch of stuff there, and of course, more importantly, left a bunch of Americans there and other Afghans who are in peril now uh, with some crazy stuff going on. And of course, the question in every American's mind is like, what happened to these people? What is going on? And uh, you guys are actually doing something about that. Can you tell us what you're doing? Yeah, it, it was a very interesting thing that happened where it seems like God kind of activated the Mount Sinai and Saudi Arabia folks to work together in order to help people like persecuted Christians, women's rights activists, people who served alongside American troops in Afghanistan after uh, the Taliban took over the place. So I got a phone call from Joel Richardson, uh, our friend that we keep mentioning, who has also uh, written a book about Mount Sinai and Saudi Arabia. And he told me about a friend of his who was involved in collecting some of the data that was necessary in order to do the evacuations before the main airport in Kabul was taken over. Mm. Um, so that's back when the U.S. government was evacuating people, but still didn't evacuate nearly enough, and many people were left behind. So through that connection with Joel, I got more and more involved in the situation, and then I brought Logan in because it was too much for one man to handle. But basically what happened was we first were collecting lots of data on at-risk Afghans, uh, and because apparently the, that data didn't exist. Uh, it wasn't in the hands of all the people that needed it. And so we were collecting this data, and once word got around that we were doing this, we almost instantly had over 5,000 emails from Afghans saying, I'm probably going to die if you don't help me. Wow. I served U.S. forces, I love America, or I'm a Christian, or I was a brave women's rights activist, uh, just absolutely terrified and beside themselves. Um, and so what we did was I teamed up with Glenn Beck's group uh, that was doing evacuations even after the U.S. government pulled out completely, and we got a group of about 50 Christians out, uh, and then Glenn Beck's group had to focus on resettlement. Mm. And now they're focused on the Ukraine. Um, and so they're doing excellent work. But Afghanistan is still a crisis. There are still tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of people there who are in peril because they dared to stand with the United States, stand for Western values, or are Christians, uh, those who led the conversion of others uh, and convinced people to become Christian, those are certainly at the most peril. That's an automatic death sentence. Mm. Uh, so what we've been focused on are, is evacuations, providing safe houses for the people who need to leave their address and we need to hide them, uh, providing food for those that can't go out or are just starving. A lot of the people there are just, just plain starving. Mm. Uh, people needing medical aid. Uh, it's really the worst crisis on earth right now, uh, comparable to Ukraine. A little bit different, but I would say it's comparable to Ukraine. And we just decide that we can't forget these people. Uh, a lot of other groups got involved and then because they ran out of money or they got they decided to focus on Ukraine, uh, switched gears. Uh, but we decided that we grew a personal relationship with a lot of these people we were helping and we weren't going to stop. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons I came on this program was to ask for help. Uh, because many of the people who face certain death at the hands of the Taliban and ISIS over there, uh, we've run out of money. Um, I've been using most of my personal money uh, to sustain us lately, but that's running out. And so we have lots of people hiding in safe houses who are due to be evicted. And when they're evicted, they can't hide from the Taliban anymore. 
Mm. Uh, and the cost of what we're asking for is really so small. Uh, when you look at what other nonprofits raise and you look at what people spend money on, I, I mean, to the point of where $210 can enable us to feed a family for a whole month and keep them in that safe house and keep them as safe as possible. Um, so we're hoping that the church stands up. All right, now, this organization um, like it has no grants, there's no government help, there's no safety net for what you're doing, really, uh, financially wise, right? Right, but yeah, we, we don't yeah. get government grants or anything like that. Uh, Logan and I have been spending our own, our own money, um, hoping that the church would provide more help than, frankly, they have been. Mm -hmm. And one of the real miracles in Afghanistan that we're seeing is that lots of people are converting to Christianity primarily because because they're seeing the love and compassion of other Christians, Afghan Christians, as well as Christians in the places like the United States. And when you talk to them, they're kind of leery and suspicious at first because they say, uh, what do you mean? Someone over in America on the other side of the world cares enough about me to sacrifice for me? It's like mm -hmm. almost like a foreign concept. And so when they say, why are you doing this? And you just say, because I'm a Christian, this is what we do. And we're going to do it regardless of whether you convert or not. We do it because we care about human beings. Uh, it, they become fascinated with it. I've seen how many uh, um, Afghans, how little they know about Christianity. Usually they'll say, yeah, we understand that you worship three gods, a falsehood. <laughs> and, that, and that's okay. it. Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> and, so yeah, and, I can think that. And then you have to break through that myth. Um, but what is disappointing is that right after the joy of being able to tell them that there are people around the world who love you and Christians, even though you're a Muslim, uh, are going to come to your rescue because we, that's what we believe, that's what we want to do. Uh, they then say, oh, what, well, Christians believe this? Well, where's everybody else? Good question. And I don't have a good answer to that. Mm. And, and so that moment where you're really changing someone emotionally and spiritually, it does reach a bit of a brick wall where you have to then say, you have to be held accountable for the church's lack of action, especially in regards to persecuted Christians. Mm -hmm. I mean, the persecuted Christians there, you really have to hear their stories, and we have some of them yeah. uh, that we'll share with you, uh, but hearing how distraught they are, when they say, well, you know, we thought the church would stick around, or, or maybe the church didn't even show up. Um, those are tough conversations for us to have. So in the first place, where can people go to support what you're doing? And we want to talk about that as well. What's the website they should go to? AfghanLibertyProject.org. Okay, Afghan, okay, very good. So there's the information on the bottom of the screen there. Now, of course, there's, you know, every time there's something like this comes up, there's always this, well, you know, once the money goes into your hands, is it going to get hijacked somewhere along the way? I mean, how can I be sure that, my donation is gonna make it to these folks who actually need the help and it's actually going to help them. Yeah, perfectly fair to be cynical. Uh, you hear a lot about corruption in nonprofits. I totally get yeah. it. If you're uncomfortable making a donation to our 501c3 uh, so that we can support the Afghans, if you feel better about sending it to an Afghan directly and that Afghan is comfortable with making connections with you, cut me out of the process. Cut Logan out of the process so that you know 100% that your money is going right to that Afghan who is surviving solely because of your generosity. Hmm. So very few nonprofits I'm aware of are willing to do that. But that's how sincere we are about saying we want to help the Afghans. If you have any questions or any doubts about where the money goes after donating to us and you don't mind losing the tax deduction, go direct with the Afghans, we'll help you. Wow. Now, so you guys are not physically over there. You're working right. with folks who are there. So what, what's being provided for these folks? What? Uh... I mean, anything and everything that they could possibly need. I mean, we're providing, as Ryan said, safe houses, medical care, food. When it was winter, we were, we were providing blankets, heating supplies, just things that they hmm. need um, to continue living and thriving and surviving. Um, we provide uh, transportation to places they need to go to, like if they need to go to a hospital. We've done that. Hmm. Um, and if they they need if they actually need the funds like the physical funds delivered to them we have we have people there that can actually deliver the funds to people if they need them or deliver so they don't have to go out of their safe houses we have people we work with that can deliver these items and these materials to the people in their safe house so they don't have to leave so yeah, yeah, the underground church has actually taught us yeah. a lot about how to do this. Yeah, yeah, we, we're that's we're primarily working with the underground church in Afghanistan. The persecuted Christians there are the ones that we've set up this safe house network with, um, and it's it's really amazing to see because.
because it's it really is you know brothers and sisters in Yeshua on other sides of the world coming together for something that's so important because you know we're we're supposed to be there for one another and help one another and you know Yeshua says like if you've done it to one of the least of these you've done it to me all right and so this is actually we're actually, at least I feel, living that out in real time, in real life. And yeah, we're, we're here, but we work with very trusted partners, very trusted, vetted Afghans that we know are sincere and a part of the underground church um, on the other side of the world there. And who would have thought that working on Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia is what would have brought us here? Yeah. Right. You yeah. Know, that we'd be working with Joel Richardson yet again, except in something completely different. Um, but it's been amazing to see how uh, God has used us and other people that we work with, including people in Afghanistan. Like Logan said, we work closely with the underground church and they help non-Christians as well. And in fact, they don't broach the topic of saying, oh, well, we want you to convert and have that awkward conversation of here's some food so you can survive. Now convert. That's not how it goes. Right. If the person says, why are you doing this? I'm a Christian. And then if the conversation's meant to progress further, it naturally does. You just try to act like Jesus as much as you can. And people want to know why you're doing that, and they want to know more about Jesus and Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You've even had conversations with some of the Afghans where they've talked with you firsthand to, to learn more about the ones that are Muslim, wanting to learn more about Christianity and asking, can you teach me? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Wow. And that's been, it's been, that's really cool. And it's amazing because they also have the internet. So I don't know exactly why, maybe culturally it just hasn't gotten in there where, where they've said, okay, well, I can look up anything on the internet and research for myself, or maybe they just learn better, prefer to be taught directly since that's how they learned Islam and now they want to learn Christianity directly from someone. Uh, but all that comes at really great risk. Um, so there's one person, an Afghan, who we were rescuing, him and his family, and they had a bounty out on them um, because of Taliban supporters uh, who knew that he had been converting people um, away from Islam into Christianity. And if you do that under the Taliban Sharia law, it's an automatic death sentence. The, the punishment for that is execution. But a lot of these guys are monsters. And so it's not just enough to kill someone sometimes. Sometimes they torture. They do other horrible things. Uh, they see it as an opportunity to attack the whole family. Um, so as bad as the rules are, just know they go even worse than what the Sharia rules are. Mm. Um, and so we're in a situation where we had that Christian in a safe house um, that the Taliban was hunting. And then the Taliban moved in next door, above him, below him, and actually had the flag outside. And they were searching homes in the area. And I mean, within the nick of time, I mean, we had maybe like five, 10 minutes left. Uh, we had a security team that did go in there. Um, I can't give away all of our tricks, um, but we were able to get the Taliban to go to another location um, and then enable our security team to go in, do a snatch and grab, grab the guy and drive him and bring him to safety to the new safe house. Mm. That's amazing. And to me, you can do all of this through your phone. I mean, we're not in Afghanistan. The, the power of the individual right now is so enormous. I think everyone, even millennials, aren't aware of the power that they all have. Mm -hmm. Now, not just anybody can go and, and do this. People are like, well, how can I help somebody in Afghanistan? You have some background that helps you with that. It helps me so with that. What, yeah. what is your background? So I have a background in national security. I first started working for a security company when I was 16 years old. Um, and I've been kind of obsessed with these topics since I was a kid. That's how I had fun, was studying this type of stuff. Um, and so I worked for the security company when I was a teenager and then started doing a lot of freelance research and doing some intelligence work, counterterrorism work. So it's something I have a 20 year history in um, and really have just been ab absorbed in. So that gave me some advantage in terms of vetting. I knew what questions to ask, how to make sure that someone isn't a secret Taliban sympathizer or someone just saying, oh, I'm a Christian in the hopes of getting aid. Because you do come across those people that aren't actually Christian, but then say they are uh, just in the hopes of getting assistance. But so far, our track record, as far as we can tell, has been 100%. Um, none of our uh, systems have been breached. Uh, we haven't had anyone in our safe houses caught and, and killed. Um, and we haven't brought in anyone who we later found out was a fraud. Mm -hmm. So again, these safe houses, as you mentioned, sometimes these things get found out and the Taliban 
closes in. So when you you know when you're moving from safe house to safe house, people might say, well, are you getting? Like you mentioned before you're getting people out. Uh, you know, can, can I help get someone out? Yes, okay. absolutely. I mean, it's it's the point where sometimes we can do an evacuation of an individual for as little as twelve hundred dollars. I mean, you can directly save a life. I'll introduce you to the person if you want um, in order to know that it's all true. And people like those relationships. The Afghans like to know people who are helping them. Mm. Um, so you really can save a life if you have an extra $1,000 that you can spare. But I do know this. I know every single church across the country and around the world is capable of saving at least one person. Wow. I mean, I can't imagine that there's any church out there that is unable to do that unless it's only got a few people who don't have any extra money. Um, but every church I've ever been to definitely has the ability to at least save one person. So I'm challenging each church to at least do that. And if they can't do that, then consider a donation for some food. Mm -hmm. um, or for winter clothing, because the winter in Afghanistan is extremely, extremely deadly. Uh, it, it's not just the heat the rest of the year. It's the actual winter where people starve. They were estimating that up to a million children could have starved this winter and died. Uh, luckily, international aid came in. But still, a lot of people we know were almost starving to death. There's mm. people who are going without food in our safe houses right now because we're out of funds. And that's something that you can solve. I mean, for $20 to $50, we can get the winter clothing that keeps them alive. Mm. And even for Sabbath groups, um, you know, a lot of Sabbath, you know, Torah groups uh, around the country, just home home groups, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, are not that many people, uh, and, and you could you could easily band get together. band together and, and help someone like this. Yeah. yeah. Now your dollar goes a lot farther in Afghanistan, like it does in a lot of places. Uh, you know, we should take advantage of this while we can. Right. <laughs> the U.S. dollar yeah. still has some value. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, tell us just in, in today's U.S. dollars, uh, what what kind of things can we do for what kind of price? Well, like I was saying, uh, you, for only about 20 to $50, we can get the winter clothing so someone can survive through the winter um, when that hits. Um, about $210 for a family of five, we can feed them. For a whole month. Um, for, for a whole, whole month, month. Whole yes. Month. Thank wow. you, a whole month. Yeah. Um, I know that you've got some other ones. And yeah. also, why don't you tell the story of uh, Moshe? As well. Okay, yeah, we'll get into the story of Moshe. But yeah, it's things are there are cheap. Not you were just saying for you know about two hundred ten dollars you can feed a family of five for like a whole month. There's also a variety of different food packages you can you can provide to these kinds of people that we're that we're working with there uh, to deliver to the families. Even like a basic package, like there's a basic kind of like survival only, like the bare bones of what you need. Like the two hundred ten dollar one gives them some variety of things that they can enjoy. But like even for like a hundred bucks, you can get like a whole a whole family here we're talking maybe four or five people you can that goes a long way you can put the picture on the screen of those kids yeah um and you can get an idea of what they're eating i mean it's bread and a little bit of tea yeah but it saved their lives yeah and they love it and they're very they are very grateful for it too um do you want to transition in the story of moshe uh or do well you, do we have enough time left or you want to save that for we're the gonna next? say that's a good Good point there, uh, Ryan. Let's let's save that for the next. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like he's watching the clock or something. <laughs> so we'll be back in just a few minutes to talk more about this, and we'll talk about Moshe. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's that's great. So we're going to talk more about that, and we have you to thank for it. Thank you for bringing these guys here, so we can tell other folks about this. And please tell other people about this. Tell them about the website. We'll put it on the screen. There it is, right there. Tell your Sabbath group about this. Tell other Sabbath groups about this, because this is what we need to help others. You know, we talk about prepping. We did, remember, we did the whole series on prepping here on Shabbat Night Live. Yes, we need to prep for ourselves, but these people in Afghanistan are going through it now. They need a prepper kit that they can use now for survival. So the next chunk of money that you come into to, you know, bump up your, your own survival pack, how about sending it over to Afghanistan? Now, there's an idea. Now, we want to thank you for bringing these guys here, and uh, you've made it possible. We pray that you would make it possible for others to see in the future. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Thank you.
Thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. As we were talking about in the first segment, uh, Afghanistan, we pulled out, it left a mess, but now there's some opportunities to help people there. And uh, something curious, I guess we found out going in there, is that uh, there's possibly a lost tribe of Israel. In yeah. Afghanistan? Yeah. Tell us about that. I found this really fascinating. So there's some members of the Pashtun community, which is the same community that most of the Taliban come from. Uh, the that, Taliban? Uh, yes, the Taliban largely come from the okay. Pashtun uh, ethnicity within Afghanistan. But there's some of them that, that believe that they are one of the lost tribes of Israel and claim that they can, to an academic degree, actually trace them, themselves back to like King David. Um, wow. And they fervently believe this, and they even practice some Jewish customs, uh, and they're very passionate about it. And so we met someone who identified as Jewish. Not exactly uh, the thing you want to be doing in Afghanistan, yeah. but he was also an activist, did some journalism work. And you add that on top of fighting anti-Semitism and promoting positive Jewish-Muslim Muslim relations while saying you're Jewish, the guy's a high-level target at that point. Um, and so I remember him calling me um, as he felt the Taliban was around like his office, probably looking for him, just absolutely terrified. Um, but the underground church ended up rescuing him. Uh, so we called the underground church that we work with, and we said, there's a guy who identifies as Jewish, which they found to be shocking. Uh, and I said, it's a very dangerous situation. And without many questions asked, they risk their own lives to go rescue him. And they've done the same thing uh, for Muslims as well. Hmm. Um, and I mean, the love and compassion of these people is just astonishing. Now, the individual who identifies as Jewish, we call him Moshe. That's not his real name. Uh, we did successfully evacuate him working with Glenn Beck's organization uh, back in maybe October, I think. Um, and so he is now in the United Arab Emirates. Um, but the story isn't over because unfortunately what happened was is he has a uh, fiance who was left behind. She, mm. she wasn't able to make the evacuation flight in time um, because of some personal issues that had gone on. Uh, and so we're trying to reunite them. And so that's, he's very help, very thankful for the fact that we saved his life. But when you also have the love of your life remaining in Afghanistan, there's a lot of tears that are shed. I'll bet, yeah, especially when, it, as the man, you're supposed to be the protector, and, exactly. and you yeah. escaped and she didn't. Uh, that uh, feels awful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. thank you guys for, for uh, making the attempt to get them reunited. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So there's other stories here about, uh, there's one of, of a guy who was hiding out in a hole? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so Saeed, um, Saeed, he was he was somebody that we, we got into a safe house. So it was he his wife and his brother, and they were all hiding in a hole. And we actually actually sent us pictures of the hole that they were hiding in. And this was in the time right around like winter time too, when we first contact, got, got in contact with him. And he was hiding out there in a hole in the ground, trying to stay, you know, s secure and protected from the Taliban. And persecuted Christian. Yeah, he was a persecuted Christian. Mm -hmm. He's, we can refer to him really as, as the preacher. Yeah. He is one of these people who was, ris who prior to the Taliban takeover was evangelizing. And he was, he was responsible for converting people from Islam to Christianity. In fact, after we got him into a safe house, he told us about two friends of his who were hiding from the Taliban. And we were able to then pull them into our safe house network as well. Um, and he, he felt responsible for their lives. And when we got them into their, into the safe house network and started communicating with him, uh, sorry, communicating with them, um, they just, they had nothing but praises to say about him and just what he did. And he, He's, he's, yeah, very high value target. And because of his, his ethnicity, he's also very recognizable. So mm. it was, thankfully, we were able to pull him in and get him hidden. Yeah. And to give you a further idea of the risks that these people take, uh, particularly in the underground church, uh, we have some pictures that uh, people, some people may want to turn away uh, okay. and not see because they're a little bit graphic. Um, but if you write against the Taliban um, or even just their ideology overall, uh, then they want to remove that hand. Um, they'll at least cut it open. And so at least two of the Christians that we work with, we know, have uh, big scars on their arms from when the Taliban cut them open. Uh, so we'll show a couple of pictures um, of the wound, then also the scar, um, so, so you get an idea of the situation over there. Um, but these are all people that everyone can help. And on a personal level, uh, I've got to tell you, if you suffer from any type of depression or anxiety or anything, it, this is going to help you. 
I mean, I was going through some tough stuff uh, while this was going on. I've got to say, all those negative thoughts in my mind went away. I mean, it was better than any medication I could have ever asked for. Uh, and so anyone that's out there thinking, oh, I can't do anything or I'm sad, so maybe I'll do it sometime later. No, you're the person that actually needs to get involved in this because it's going to benefit you on a personal and spiritual level as well as the people that you're directly helping. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And can I add to that too, Ryan, not only with uh, talking about some of the things that these Afghans go through, um, you're talking about the people that had their hands nearly severed. Yeah. We also, there was also an incident where there was a, a Christian father and son who had been captured by the Taliban. And then we got in contact with them, specifically our rescue operations uh, manager. I want to give her a shout out, Alana Ritter. She's amazing. Uh, she was in contact with these people, but the father and the son were captured by the Taliban and they were tortured. And they were, this would be another graphic picture to show, but they were actually dripping acid onto the boy's stomach. Oh. And they were trying to get the father and the son to convert from Christianity to Islam, and they refused. And eventually, because the Taliban are corrupt and easily bribed, uh, he was, the father was able to bribe their way out of the situation and let, they let him go. Wow. And so we're now working with, with that family too, trying to help them. That's amazing. Wow, so I'm sure you have a thousand stories here. I see we have lots of uh, information in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> All kinds yeah. of, uh, what, what else can you tell us? What's going on there? What, what can be done? Well, there's one really miraculous story uh, that happened involving uh, two sisters. Uh, Logan, I'll let you take that Okay, one. so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best at this. This one, again, shout out to Alana because she was the one who handled this. Now, as you guys are both saying, we've, had, we've been inundated with emails coming into the email inbox asking for help, different pleas. And Alana really focused in on, a, she's focused in on a ton of people, but these were two people that she really focused in on, two, two women, both Christian, one of them, is a widow and she has two young boys. All right, so young, single, Christian mother, two young boys in Afghanistan, not, not good. All right, she's in our safe house. The other one was another woman uh, where her father was the victim of a bomb blast. He's still alive, but he has a very bad infection that we're trying to get medical care for. The mother had blood cancer and sadly, the mother was so far along in the blood cancer that she actually passed away in the safe house. Um, but the, the sister, or the, the, um, the, the woman and the father are still are still there, and I believe they have one other family member with them yes. too. Okay, so the the widow back to her. Her husband uh, died in an explosion. There was a Taliban explosion at an office that they worked at. I believe it was a visa office yes. or a passport office, um, and that explosion killed her husband. So that's how she became a widow. Well, these two women, Alana starts to notice as she's communicating with them that it seems they worked in the same office at some point. Okay. And not only that, one of the women starts talking about a sister that she had, a long lost sister, and she starts describing how I had this sister, she married somebody, and then there was some, there was some friction in the family with the father because of that, and so she went off and we don't really know what's become of her. And then Alana was talking with the widow and was kind of getting information from her about a sister that she had. And as Alana- They thought she was dead. Yeah, this, they, they, they thought she was, they, they, were, oh, okay. they, thought they, were, yep. they yeah. were dead, they didn't know this. Um, and as Alana dug deeper and got more information out of both of them, the stories became parallel. And all these details started lining up precisely. And then we realized, Alana realized, and then we realized these were the two sisters. <laughs> wow. They were yeah. the two sisters. And what are the odds of that? That two separate women reached out in the inbox, Alana connected with both of them, and they start telling and sharing their stories. They're both Christians, both persecuted Christians, and it turns out that these are the long lost sisters of yeah. like a separation of six years. Of yeah. six years. Yeah. Wow. And so Alana was able to safely kind of reconnect them over kind of like a private chat and they were able to reconnect and we're hoping that eventually, they're, they're both actually uh, scheduled for flights out of Afghanistan. Um, oh, and wonderful. so we're hoping, yeah. pending some of the family friction there, we're hoping that the family can be reunited when they get out of Afghanistan. Oh, that's yeah. great. I mean, what are the odds? You can consider how many emails we get I mean, tens of thousands of messages now, um, far beyond the initial 5,000 that I mentioned, because so, so many just kept pouring in. And then somehow, out of all those thousands of messages, Alana 
really just has some, something's telling her these two people yeah. to focus on. Hmm. And then it ends up being two long lost sisters that both thought the other one was probably dead. Yeah. 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 Wow. It's just, it's amazing. And it's, it's, I think it speaks to God being in this too. I think it speaks yeah. to his presence, you know, Yehovah's hand being on this and being in this and, and connecting people um, that, you know, like Ryan just said, they both probably thought each other was dead and here they are in our safe house network and could potentially be re, uh, reunited in a country of refuge. Mm, yeah. Absolutely amazing. So yeah, it tells you, Yehovah is in control of all of this, uh, despite all the negative things happening. Um, so your organization, what, what made you want to even start this? <laughs> you know, it really just kind of fell in our laps. Like I said, it was that one phone call from Joel Richardson, mm-hmm. who uh, I guess he knew that I had some Afghan like fans on Twitter because I was just really hammering the idea that we need to back the resistance to the Taliban and not abandon our allies. Mm. A, a real genius concept. <laughs> but that one, apparently, uh, the U.S. administration chose not to follow. And so Joel knew um, that I was involved in this type of stuff, and I guess he just felt it made sense to connect me with this other individual who was collecting the data on Afghans and said, you know, I think you two can work together. And Joel does his own work also um, and has helped us in a number of cases too. Uh, so we continue to work very closely, even though we're part of separate charities. Yeah. Joel helped us get food to some of our people before. Yeah. yeah. Life-saving food. Yeah. Like really. When they really needed it. Yeah. It was amazing. So now if a group is looking at this going, okay, we want to go big. We want to get some out. It's not just, you mentioned there's, you know, $1,200 we get someone out. In some cases. Otherwise, yeah. sometimes the price can be as high as 4000 but it, it depends on what country you're evacuating to, the situation, and things like that. So right. it ranges between eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 and $4,000, $5,000. So, and for that larger amount, I mean, you can support somebody for a while too. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's, that's the big difference because sometimes the more affordable evacuation routes won't involve uh, after support. They just show up and then they're kind of on their own or we're still supporting them. But there are programs out there where you can actually evacuate someone and then they'll get six months or a year of humanitarian aid, food and shelter yeah. and things like that so they can transition to a new life. The other uh, point that I forgot to mention is the issue of child brides uh, yeah. because <laughs> in some cases just not even being a U.S. ally or persecuted Christian, just having a young daughter um, or someone being an orphan, um, that means to many of the radical fundamentalists over there that that can be their new wife. Uh, and so you never want to have a young girl or even an adult woman that's single walking around there because they could be kidnapped. In fact, there was a 13-year-old girl that was kidnapped, a Christian girl, um, who was part of a family that was in one of our safe houses. It wasn't because we had any compromise on our side. It was they had to go out to get um, bread. And she went there and she was kidnapped. And then there was a a crazy miracle. I'm still not quite sure how it all happened, uh, where our, the people we were working with were passing around the pictures saying, if you see her, just, just know she's been kidnapped. I didn't have much optimism at that point because it had been over 24 hours since she was kidnapped. And then a car pulls up to a Taliban checkpoint and the girl, the kidnapped girl is there and she looks out the window and a woman who recognized her saw her and they both started yelling towards each other and the kidnappers just gave up at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's, that's unbelievable that that would happen. Mm-hmm. Wow. Again, you know Yehovah is in control yeah. when something like that happens. Yeah. yeah. Something really miraculous. It's, yeah, it's amazing. And there have been many other, it's, it just seems like it's, all of this is chock full of miracles. Like yeah. you can see these things, you can see his hand, his guiding hand in all of this. And it's just been, like I said, it's been, it's been amazing and a blessing to, to be a part of, even though it is hard and it can be really, really rough as you're trying to go through it, trying to raise yeah. the funds to help people or dealing with people that are in these tough situations. But yeah. yeah. And there are people who continue to fight the Taliban, some of who we have provided life saving assistance to. Um, sometimes we don't know that they're part of the resistance. Sometimes we do know. Um, but there is an s- overall solution to all this. So if you get involved, you don't have to think, oh, well, I'm on the hook for supporting a family indefinitely. Don't feel like you have an obligation. Your obligation is just to do what you can now and not really think beyond that. But I still believe the Taliban one day is going to collapse. 
Um, I don't believe that they have stay, staying power. Uh, there is there are resistance forces fighting both ISIS and Af and the Taliban in Afghanistan, among other terrorists, and they're gaining in support. I mean, imagine if the U.S. provided just a tiny fraction of the aid that goes to Ukraine, and I support the aid going to Ukraine, but just imagine if a tiny fraction of that went to Afghanistan to help those that are fighting the Taliban and ISIS. I think you could see that, that regime collapse within a matter of six months. Hmm. I mean, this is a solvable issue. And I, as a national security analyst, that very much frustrates me um, because taking on the Russians is, I mean, that's a big task. Taking on the Taliban, they're a bunch of buffoons. It's not that big of a task. It just requires a little bit of investment. And in fact, you don't even need the U.S. government to do it. If people around the world, look at what we're doing with our cell phones, just a few of us. But if people, including the church around the world, got together and provided humanitarian aid to those that need it, this, it would be minimized. And even go a step further, if people supported the resistance to the Taliban and ISIS, they could defeat the Taliban and ISIS independently. You wouldn't have to say, oh, well, you have to vote the right person in office. No, in today's world, Americans, people in the free world can come together and actually fight our enemies and save the people that they're trying to persecute. So people might listen to that and say, okay, well, wait a minute. We as Americans had our military over there for how many years? Right. And we co couldn't defeat the Dal Taliban. Why? Well, think of it this way. Uh, the initial phase of the war in Afghanistan in 2001 went pretty well. Why? Because we backed a group called the Northern Alliance, people who lived there, um, local tribal leaders who were fighting the Taliban for a long period of time. Uh, then we kind of switched strategy and we started trying to build these national Afghan security forces that we had a lot of problems with. What I'm arguing for right now is going back to that first model that worked right after 9-11 when the Taliban was defeated in the blink of an eye. Uh, you, it's supporting the exact same people. In fact, the son of the leader of those resistance forces back in 2001 is leading them now. So instead of just abandoning something and saying, you know, there's just no hope, especially when it has such direct uh, ramifications for American national security, I'm saying let's just go with the model that works. So how does someone get involved? They look at this and say, great, good idea. What do I do? Well, that's something you can talk to politicians about if you're trying to get governmental aid on. Right now, I would say it, the best role someone can play is in saving the lives of people. Um, the issue of supporting the resistance, that's something I could go on and on on uh, about over and over and over. Um, but the role that people can definitely play, everybody, is actually saving the country from even further catastrophe and saving those persecuted Christians and importantly, saving U.S. allies because groups like the Iranian regime and terrorist groups are trying to recruit people who are suffering so much that they just need a little bit of money in order to feed their family. And if you have to choose between your family dying or giving up classified U.S. information or sharing the skills that you got when you were trained by the United States, you're going to be willing to do that and, and assist that terrorist group if it means that your family's going to die otherwise and you're going to die otherwise. So desperate people are doing desperate things and, and things are being given up. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So are there Americans over there as well who are trapped and are, are we helping them or is it mainly the Afghan folks who are in this situation? It's mostly the Afghan folks. Um, the last I heard there was about a dozen, I think, U.S. citizens that were there, but there's also relatives that are abandoned there, um, people who like got married to an Afghan and, and oh, things see. like that. Um, and then again, I mean, as far as veterans are concerned, veterans are some of the number one people that we hear from because they have interpreters over there who they grew to become like brothers yeah. with. And sometimes, sometimes they have family and best friends are over there. And one of the things that they say is that this is really bad for the trauma they suffer from going to war because now they're seeing all that they fought for evaporate because of weakness on the part of the United States. And that makes it so much harder for everyone with PTSD or trauma or even just negative thoughts in their mind from their experience serving the United States in Afghanistan. Yeah, and to add to that, we even have letters, uh, like letters from veterans talking about some of the Afghans like that we're, that we're in contact with that they're trying to reach out in the email box. And it's these letters of like basically 
I don't want to, I don't know if you'd say letters of recommendation, but just kind of letters showing that, hey, we worked with these people, we know them. And when you read those letters, it's really heartfelt and powerful. And like, you can see these, these guys were like brothers. I mean, they were in the thick of it together. And some of the, some of the stories that they share about what this American veteran and what this Afghan interpreter or, or member of the Afghan, like military branch that they were working with there, what they went through together, like they're close knit. The, the tie is strong. The bond is strong. And it's like they just they just want to help them. They just yeah. want to help get but them out. Most of them have letters from their veteran friends and family yeah. uh, who they served with. And so if the veteran doesn't contact us directly, in many cases, it's the Afghan contacting us, but saying, here's how you can know I'm for real. Contact this veteran who I worked with. He saved my life or I saved his life. Hmm. Um, and so as, as far as I'm concerned, when people say, well, the U.S. military isn't in Afghanistan anymore, well, the Afghans who served with us, uh, they're pretty close to, mm. to being Americans, as far as I'm concerned. If you're willing to put your life on the line um, to side with the United States and improve the national security of my country, then you're an American ally pretty close to being an American yourself. Yeah, I have a couple of friends who were in Afghanistan, and after they saw the, the disastrous pullout, they were, uh, yeah, it threw their PTSD into overdrive, yeah. and they had big, real big problems with it because they risked their lives for, for, for what? So yeah. Now, how can we help save lives? We have about 30 seconds left to tell folks sure. how, to, how to help out. The best thing they can do is go to afghanlibertyproject.org, um, and that's where you go and donate. And if you have any other ideas or, or anything, uh, you can also contact us there and share your thoughts. All right, great. Thank you. Ryan right. Morrow. Thank you. And uh, Logan. Key Sweater, thank you very much thank for being here. Thank you for being here. I think it's been a very important message. We're going to talk more on a love gift about that, so make sure you look out for that. And until then, uh, thank you for watching Shabbat Night Live. Thank you for bringing these guys here. And we'll see you next time on Shabbat Night Live. Shavuot Tov. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new MichaelRood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.